Quest number 91, Shadow of the Storm. Just outside the bank in al Karid is Father Reen, who is looking for us. He says that he has an urgent task that only we can do using Silverlight, the demon-slaying sword we got back in 2001. He says the wizard Danath is preparing to summon a demon named Agrith Nar. For those who don't remember, Danath is the person responsible for summoning Delrith underneath Varrock four years ago. He says Danath, along with a group of apprentice dark wizards, have gone to use her. Here's the kicker. Father Reen wants us to let Danath succeed in summoning Agrith Nar, so we can use the opportunity to kill him once and for all. He goes on to explain Agrith Nar is a demon with magical powers that he uses to influence the mortal plane even when he's not here. Father Reen tells us to find his partner and user, named Badden. We fly to user and find Badden. He explains that Agrith Nar is responsible for a significant amount of misfortune that befalls the people of RuneScape. We ask why Danath came to user. He says there may be something here he needs to summon Agrith Nar. We tell him we opened a portal to a demon's realm from here, and he believes that must be why he came. He tells us we need to infiltrate the group of Dark Wizards so we can kill Agrith Nar as soon as he's summoned. We go into User, and the portal to the Demon's Realm is now guarded by Evil Dave. We tell him we want to join their group. He admits they need one more person, but only evil people can join. He says we don't dress evil, whatever that means. We don our ghostly robes we got from the victims of Zaros, and dye Silverlight black using some of the mushroom ink from down here. Now he believes we're evil. Evil Dave escorts us to the throne room. Danath is waiting. He says something about someone named Joseph running away. We speak with Danath and tell him we want to join their cult. He promises us power over life and death. He says all we have to do is recite the summoning incantation with the rest of them. He tells us to memorize it. Nahudu, Agrithnar, Carminthum, Kaldar, Terran. Additionally, we'll need to make ourselves a demonic sigil, but we'll need to get a mold from one of the others. We get it from Jennifer. We go to al Karid and make the sigil, then return to the demon plane. Danath isn't ready preparing, so we speak with Matthew. We ask him what happened to Joseph. Matthew says him and Joseph wanted to learn how the summoning spell worked. He secretly read the book that Danath was hiding from them. Whatever he saw in there caused him to run away with it. Matthew doesn't think he could have gotten far in the desert holding the book, so he probably hid it somewhere close. We go outside and speak to the golem. We ask if he saw Joseph. He says Joseph hid the book somewhere in the broken kilns nearby, then he says Danath came out and killed him. We find the book, titled The Confession of Elamar. We take it inside and read it. Elamar is a Ceredominus scholar scheduled for execution by the church. He writes that he studied demonic texts to learn more about their enemies. He learned that Agrithnar is able to cause natural disasters when working from his own plane, and created a ritual to summon him to RuneScape. The details of the ritual are in the book, but one thing that's different from what Delrith is telling us to do is the incantation. It's backwards. Elamar writes that he was successful in summoning Agrithnar, but was unable to damage him with magic or weapons. They decided to do something else, but we don't know what, as the remainder of the pages were torn out. We return to Matthew, and he also notices the incantation is reversed. Danath announces that the preparations are complete, and we take our spot in the circle. Everyone recites the incantation. A magic circle appears, which Danath steps into and disappears. Matthew surmises that a summoning ritual spoken backwards undoes it, and that Danath had been Agrith Nar shapeshifted into human form this entire time. All of a sudden, the dimension starts to crumble and shake. Three of the apprentices flee, but Matthew says we need to get them back, and find another person to replace Danath to perform the summoning ritual again. We go outside the portal and see one of the apprentices killed by ghosts. We find Evil Dave, and he says the other apprentice was killed as well. We tell him he needs to go back to the portal, so we can do the ritual again. He does. We head outside where Father Reen and Father Badden are waiting, along with a fierce sandstorm. We tell them the situation and hand them both a sigil. Then, we speak with the golem and ask it to help us as well. It says it is explicitly forbidden from entering Thamron's realm. We open his skull and remove the directive, and hand him a sigil. We return to the demon plane and perform the ritual the correct way, summoning Agrith Nar. He immediately incinerates Matthew, then focuses his gaze on us. We strike him down with Silverlight, and as we deliver the final blow, the sword seems to fuse with the demon's ichor-like blood, becoming stronger. Quest complete. We also get a 10k combat XP lamp, which we put on a ranged for 62 ranged. Quest number 92, Making History. Near the Arandar Pass entrance, we find an outpost. Inside is a man named Joral. We talk to him, but he's upset. He says that this building has a history spanning generations, but King Lothis ordered it to be torn down to build a new alchemist lab. We ask how the king could disregard the history of this place, and Joral admits he doesn't know what the history is. 
He asks us to find some evidence of historical greatness to convince King Lossus to leave it alone. He says this building was originally an outpost used to watch for incoming armies before they arrive in Ardoyan. He hopes to turn it into a museum. He says there are three people who may be able to help. A traitor in Ardoyan, a ghost in Port Fasmanus, and a warrior in Raleka. The traitor is named Aaron. According to the records of this place, his great-grandfather lived here at some point. Next, he said he's heard of a rumor of a ghost in Port Fasmanus who lost his life to this place. His name is Droalak. Finally, the warrior is a Fremenic named Drawn. Drawn has studied many wars, and since Jorl thinks this place was involved in some, Drawn may know more. He says we may need to speak with his brother, Blanin, first. We start with Droalak in Port Fasmatis. He confirms that he did indeed die in the outpost. He says he carries with him a scroll that describes the timeline of the outpost, but says we'll need to help him with a problem before he'll give it to us. He says he left to go to the outpost against his wife's wishes and promised to return, but he died. She never forgave him for this. He asks us to help get her forgiveness. He says she may be receptive to a sapphire amulet. We find her and give her the amulet, causing her to forgive him immediately. She passes on to the afterlife, freed from her grudge. Jormalak gives us the scroll and tells us to return to him once we've confirmed it's useful, so he can move on as well. Next, we find Drawn and Raleka. He refuses to speak with us. Instead, we speak with Blanin, brother of Drawn. He says in order to have Drawn speak with us, we need to know a bunch about him. And we can't mention that Blanin sent us. He tells us everything we need to know, and we return to Drawn. He asks us a bunch of questions. He wields an iron mace, eats rats for breakfast, kittens for lunch, and bunnies for tea. His favorite drink is red spider blood. He's 36 years, 8 months, and 21 days old. Studies battles of the 4th and 5th ages. Lives in the northeastern side of town, and his pet cat is named Fluffy. He agrees to answer all of our questions. He tells us he's read of a battle that took place at the outpost many years ago. Two ex-friends led forces and clashed there, which resulted in the two fighting at the top of the outpost as the sole survivors. He says they were friends, but because they worshipped different gods, they became enemies. However, after the battle, they both renounced their gods and started worshipping Guthics. Finally, we find Aaron, the silver merchant in Ardoyan. We ask him about the outpost and tell him Lothus is planning on tearing it down. He wants it to be saved and tells us that his great-grandfather lived and died there. However, all they really have left is a strange key that changes temperatures depending on where it is. He gives us the key, we feel it, and it's freezing. We run in a direction and it warms up a little. Eventually, it gets burning hot as we head towards the observatory. We find a chest buried in the dirt and unlock it using the key. Inside is a book titled Drozel's Journal. Drozel writes that he met a great follower of Zamorak who offered him the chance to join him for great power and desolation of others. They're moving to the outpost. He starts getting overwhelmed pretty quick just by how evil everyone else there is. They start poisoning the water supply, literally setting people on fire, and eventually Drozel makes the children of the city invisible. Eventually, the townspeople find out that they are responsible and the city hired some sort of help that will be upon them soon. That's where the journal ends. We read the scroll that Drozelak gave us next, and it tells us that the outpost was built at the start of the Fifth Age. 65 years later, the years of tragedy happened, which is likely the things described in Drozel's journal. And three years after that, there was a great battle. The survivors of the battle started a new line of kings three years later. We take all the evidence to Drozel. He's able to complete the story. Two friends had a falling out over religion. The Zamorakian moved here and caused havoc for the townspeople. The townspeople called upon the Ceridominus, which happened to be led by his old friend. The battle went on, leaving the two friends as the sole survivors who reflected on their actions and they started a new line of kings. One became king to spread equality, and the other the head of the market. The one who became king would be Lothus's great-grandfather. He gives us a letter for us to deliver to the king. Lothus agrees to allow Joral to turn the outpost into a museum. We return to Joral and he installs some display cases. Quest complete. We return to Jorovalak and let him know he can move on. Quest number 93, Rat Catchers. This quest is something else. I'm going to have it entirely voice acted for your viewing pleasure. It must be great then, I hear you saying. No. No, 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 no. No. It is undeniably the worst quest in the game. I'm not even exaggerating a little bit. I'm having it voiced because I want to show exactly why. It's the worst quest in the game. I'm not going to summarize any dialogue at all like I usually do. Because of this, it's going to be quite long. Nobody would blame you if you skip to the time shown on the screen right now. Seriously. You're staying? Alright, let's do this. We start the quest by speaking with Gertrude. Please understand that there is no context for this, but this is how the conversation goes. Oh yes, before I forget, 
There are some people you should meet. Who's that then? Well, there are these two ladies who know a lot about rat catching. Oh, really? Where would I find them? They generally are to be found in the sewers underneath Varrock, a horrible place. I should know. I wouldn't have thought you would have much business down in the sewers. I've had to drag Shilop and Willow out of there more times than I care for, the little rascals. I don't know which is harder, raising kids or cats. Thank you, Gertrude. I'll be sure to have a look for them. We find two women in the sewers named Things Pets and Grimes Quit. Oh, hello. What's we going here? Despite being in a vile-smelling sewer, your nostrils still pick up a sickly sweet, vinegarish odor which is wafting from their general direction. What's you want? Oh, hello. I was told by a friend that you know a lot about rat catching. I was wondering if you'd teach me a little. We know lots about rat splattering. Yeah, we know, but why should we tell you? Well, I'm a great cat owner myself, and I'd like to meet other people who are also interested in the same things, and who can perhaps teach me and my cat a trick or two about rat catching. Dear? Why? They think Fuzzies does trickses. Everyone knows he's only Dogsies does tricksies. I doesn't think they know anything about catching ratsies. Sets him a task and we'll seize. If you catches eight rats with your fuzzy, we'll tells you. How will you know that I've completed your task and what's a fuzzy? Your cat, stupid, and will smells them. Um, alright, I guess. I can't believe I'm going to do this, but what choice do I have? With that, she walks over and takes a powerful whiff of your bag. Eyes bored with this chatterbox and let's splat more ratsies. Uh, um, excuse me? The gruesome twosome seems to have lost interest in you and turned their minute intellects elsewhere. We have Leia catch eight rats, which she does without missing a single one. Good job, puss. We really showed those rats what for. What for? Oh, never mind. It's just a turn of phrase. Speaking of turning faces, shouldn't we get back to those ugly sisters? Suppose so. We speak with them again. I got the ratsies for yous. What's up with them? Didn't I tell you they were a bit thick? Uh. What a slack-jawed, mindless creature. Yeah, like, what's... I got the ratsies mean. Ooh. Hang on a second. I thought you were thick. Ha! We were only playing with you. That was funny. We should try that again on the next adventurer who comes along. They're so gullible. Believe anything we say. Okay, you've had your laugh. No, will you please show me something about rat catching? There's not much we can teach you here. No, not much at all. What, so we've just caught all these rats for nothing? Here, have the rat pole. Grimes quit hands you a rat pole. What can I use it for? You can stick the ratsies your fuzzy catches into it. Um, thanks, I guess. Will we tell him about Jimmy? Oh, I doesn't know. Oh, I doesn't know. You got all the dead ratsies with you. <laughs> no. Go on, go on. Tell them about Jimmy. Go on. You should talk to Jimmy Dazzle and Ardoyan. He could show your fuzzy a thing or two. <laughs> <laughs> you have the feeling that they'll get no end of fun from that joke, and you begin to question their intellectual capacity once more. We head to Ardoyan and find Jimmy. Ah, uh, RS3 released. I've been expecting you. You have? I have. Those repulsive sisters from the Varric sewers sent word. At the thought of Fing's pet and Grimes quit, he shudders. An odd couple. Anyway, they said you could teach me a thing or two about cats. I could, but I would need a motivation. I didn't get rich enough to afford clothes like these by giving out help so freely to every adventurer who came my way. Maybe I could help you out with something then? Ah, that's music to my ears. Well, have you anything for me to do, or will that come at a later point? No, no. I've just the ticket right here. He gives you a dazzling smile, his pearly whites, both pearly and white. Gosh, those teeth are very white and sharp. Well, I know where he gets his name from. Yes, this is just the ticket. Here. Take a good and long look at this map. You look at Jimmy Dazzler's map. On it are directions to a country manor located outside Ardoyan, in an apparently densely wooded area. Now, a wealthy client of mine, a merchant of high repute, is having a soiree. A what? A party. He gives you a look of disdain. Now, please don't interrupt me any further. He has a problem, a small furry one. So he wants me to go to his place and kill some rats? I can sort that, no probs. No, 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 it's not that simple. He can't afford to have you seen on his premises. If a vermin catcher were to be seen in his manor, think of the damage it would do to his reputation. Oh, I see. So I have to do this covertly. That's it. That's the very ticket. 
Jimmy dazzles you with another one of his trademark smiles. Now, I'm going to cast a spell on you that will allow you to carry out this task with some element of safety. Are you going to cast an invisible spell on me? That should make it easy. Not quite. You perceive an uncertain smile. You can see that his confidence in you isn't limitless. The spell will wipe the last few seconds of memory from anyone who spots you, and also teleport you a small distance away. Wow, that's some spell. I'd say that comes in handy. Jimmy gives you a knowing smile. It's the ticket, my friend. It's the ticket. Without another word, Jimmy waves his hands about and mutters something under his breath. Uncomfortable now, you search your pocket to check that you're not missing anything. Where did you learn that spell? If I told everyone all my secrets, would I be as well off as I am now? You decide not to answer. The question was obviously rhetorical. Well, let's get on with things. Carry out this simple task and I'll aid you. Now scram, get going. And remember, the map's your ticket. Oh yes, one more thing. Use a cat to dispose of the rats. Swordplay is really too noisy. Using your cat is... The ticket? We read the map and find ourselves in a large estate. We have to run past the guards without getting spotted. Easy, just go along the edge to the back of the mansion and climb up the trellis. Oh man, we were doing so good! Okay, first room, go get him, Leia. Down here, get two more. One in the kitchen. Oh, hey, all the Adorian traders are here. Bruh, what is this? Last one, caught. Good job, puss. I think that just about wraps things up here. Yeah, I suppose so. This covert rat killing just comes so naturally. Really? Why is that? I'm a cold-blooded claw totin hit kitty. Oh, what? A callous cat. I knew you had a dark side. I have many dark sides. Well, we'd better get out of here and let's do it quietly. We head back to Jimmy. Ah, uh, RS3 released. Aren't you just the ticket? I am. Congratulations on a job well done. You'll teach me all about cats now? Uh, now that's something I didn't say. Jimmy flashes you an unconvincing smile. Right. What if I want to know about grown and overgrown cats? Ah, uh, now. When it comes to grown cats, Hook knows Jack is your ticket. Where would I find him? He should be in the roughest area of Varrock, knowing him. He likes a good scrap, does Jack. I'll tell him to look out for you. We find Hook-Nosed Jack. Ah, it's RS3 release, isn't it? Jimmy D said you'd be along, so what can I do for you? You can't help but stare at Jack's mangled nose. It's not only huge, but dreadfully crooked. I wonder if he could smell around corners with that nose. Uh, sorry. E yeah, Jimmy Dazzler told me that you're the ticket if I wanted to learn about grown cats. You quickly avert your gaze from his face. You have a problem with my face? With determination not to show any signs of embarrassment, you look Jack in the eyes. No, should I? Uh, I guess not. This is just that most... Ah, forget it. So will you help me, or... Do I have to do some task for you first to prove that I'm worthy or in payment? Nah, I'm too busy. What? Oh, come on. No, really. I'm just too busy at the moment. I've got three jobs going at the minute, and I just don't have the time for helping the likes of you out. Look, if you need help catching rats, I can lend you a hand. I got some good hands-on experience from Jimmy Dazzler, Fingspan, and Grimesquit. Ah, you've met the sisters. Lovely girls, aren't they? What, does this guy have any taste or sense of smell for that matter? Uh... Yeah, lovely girls. How about I take some of your workload off you? Then you would have some time to teach me. I suppose there is this job I have just south of here. I need to get someone to clear out a warehouse of rats. Should be a simple job of poisoning a few rat holes. Nothing too complicated. So will any type of poison do? No. You need rat poison to kill rats. You can make it yourself. I'm sure I've seen some lying around. To poison the holes, you'll need some bait. Use some cheese for this. Pour some of the poison on the cheese, and then place some of the poison cheese in each of the rat holes. Okay, can do. Report back to me when you're done. I want to get this job wrapped as soon as possible. We poison four pieces of cheese and head into the warehouse nearby. We poison the four rat holes and go back to Jack. I've completed that task you sent me. Now will you teach me? Give me a second. Oh, come on. I've got and done a job for you. The least you could do is say thanks or something. I'm upset at the moment. I just found my cat Pox, and the poor thing's half dead. Oh, they found pox at the warehouse you were working at. You must have eaten some of the rats you poisoned. Oh no, I feel somewhat responsible for this. Can I help in any way? 
there is an apothecary here in town. Seek his help. Tell him that the poison was made from red spider eggs and quorn, and he should know what to do. Go quickly. We run to the apothecary. I am the apothecary. I brew potions. Do you need anything specific? I need to talk to you about cats. As I said, I am the apothecary, not the vet. Would you know anything about poisons, then? I'm quite the expert, excuse me. How about rat poisons and anti-poisons for cats? I think I can help you with that. Try me. Okay, Hooknose Jack's cat, Pox, ate some rats which were poisoned with a quorum and red spider egg based concoction. Not Pox. What a personality. I remember. Hang on. No, I have no time for dilly-dallying. I know just the thing that will sort Pox out. Great! What? Well, cats are simple enough to treat. Just bring me a bucket of milk, some ground unicorn horn, and a leaf of marintil. The apothecary carefully mixes and blends the ingredients together. He then hands you a bottle of cat anti-poison. Quick, get this to Jack. If I know the man at all, he wouldn't have sent someone else to do this if his cat wasn't seriously ill. We return to Jack. Have you got the anti-poison? Yes, I've got it right here. You hand the vial of cat anti-poison to Jack. Thank you, RS3 release. Thank you so much. No worries there. I'd be sorry to see any cat come to harm. I have to have a word with you about the job you did in the warehouse. I did a good job, didn't I? You didn't quite finish that job I set you. Hang on, I thought all I had to do was poison a few rat holes and that was it. Well, one rat survived. The biggest and nastiest one of the lot. Hang on, that wasn't part of the deal, was it? I'm afraid it was. You said you'd clear the warehouse of rats, I do remember. Did you now? I did. Now get to it. We take Leia and go to the warehouse. This may be the worst part of the quest. We have to put Leia in danger here. The king rat is stronger than she is. How we win, though, is she can eat food if I give it to her. I have to feed her through the wall while she's fighting. If I mess up, she dies. The rat inside the room looks very vicious. It could definitely hold its own against any cat. Your cat squeezes through the broken wall. Go get that nasty rat. <laughs> Come here, kitty. Leia has completed regicide. We go back to Jack. My sources tell me you were successful in killing the rat. They're not wrong. I must admit, I was getting a little worried for my own cat's safety, too. Your own cat? Yes, I had to use it to kill the rat. He was too far out of the way for me to get at it, so I sent him the fuzzy. <laughs> There's hope for you yet. That's great. So, you know things about grown and overgrown cats, then? I'm no expert on the larger cats. If you want to train overgrown cats, seek out Smokin' Joe in Keldegrim, the Dwarven City. We head to Keldegrim and find Smokin' Joe. Hi, what are you doing? Isn't it obvious? <laughs> no, not really. Joe splutters a few times, but finally clears his throat. Blech. So, <clears throat> sorry about that. Wipes some phlegm from the corner of his mouth. I'm trying to smoke these pesky rats out. <laughs> Joe breaks down into another bout of coughing. Ew, what a disgusting little dwarf. And, oh, look at the size of those ears. You notice the dwarf's enormous plate-like ears, which are constantly twitching as if he's trying to tune them to some unseen and unheard source. After two attempts, Joe gets his breath back and eventually manages to speak. I'm trying to get rid of these rats, but my lungs just aren't up for it like they used to be. <laughs> Ew! I could help you. I'm young-ish and have a fairly good set of lungs in me. That's... The dwarf suddenly starts frantically waving his arms about, gesturing that he is unable to catch his breath. You give him a forceful pat on the back, which dislodges a... Ew. Actually, I don't want to look at that. Take it from me, it ain't pretty. Ah, <sighs> that's better. Oh boy. Joe takes a deep breath. What's up with your lungs anyway? Uh, sure it wasn't eight years of blowing smoke into rat holes that has done this to me. <sighs> that and probably the pipe I used to smoke. <laughs> oh right. Anyway, where were we? You offered to help me. Of course I did. Now you want to get these rats in there. How should I go about doing that? That's sim <laughs> simple. Take this pot like the contents and blow the smoke into the hole. You look at the pot the dwarf offers you, 
and notice that it's half covered with fluidy green stuff that Joe has coughed up. No way! No way am I touching that! That's so disgusting! Hey Joe, would you mind if I made my own? I might break yours. The dwarf looks skeptically at you. Ugh, I wonder who got out of this one. You know, you'd probably catch some of my germs. Cross-species diseases are incredibly dangerous. I heard of this one village of gnomes who- You're right. <laughs> With my lungs in the current state, I just can't take chances. Sweet. So how do I make my own rat smoking device? <clears throat> uh, just take a simple pot, stick some garden weeds in it, light it, and use it on the rat hole. Great, I'll get to it. We light a pot of weeds and smoke some rats out. The rats quickly scamper back into the hole as soon as the smoke clears. Hey, RS3 released. Hey, talk to me! What's that, Cap? Can't you see him, Adventure? Look, I can't let you keep doing this. You're doing it all wrong. I am? Well then, smarty pants, what should I be doing? Well, what we have here is a two-cat job. Every time you try to smoke those rats out, they run out the hole. The only problem is, the smoke clears fast enough for them to run back in before you can get over to them. I know that. Well, then why don't you let me help you out? Tell me when you're going to start the fire, and I'll race over and get the rats while you're smoking them out. Great idea, puss. I'll get right to it. Hey, Leia, you know the drill. Get going. Exterminate! Exterminate! What? Sorry, I got a little carried away. We try again? Hey, Leia, great job. What an ambush. Hoo-ha! Uh, you know, you really scare me sometimes. I got them. Well, good show. Good. <laughs> good show. I guess you'd like to know about Wily Cats. Wily Cats? Look for the face in Port Serim. She'll show you. We find the face down in Port Serim. Ah, you peasant. Falcrash wishes to speak with you. The face contorts herself in an air of haughtiness, uncommon to those with appearances as ugly as hers. Okay, where would I find her? You should find her nearby. Hello, the face said that you were looking to talk with me. Indeed, word has gotten to me from our other Ratcatcher chapters that you are quite a talent. Well, I can't take all the credit. I've had more than a little help from my cat. Modesty, a trait seldom displayed by adventurers these days. Too many more like you and I'll lose half my business. Why is that? Epic poems of bravery and heroes aren't usually commissioned by the shy and retiring. Smoking Joe so that you know lots about training wily cats. Indeed I do! It's for this very reason that I requested to talk to you. So you'll show me how to turn my cat into a wily cat? No, not yet. <sighs> no, I need you to carry out just one task for me. Well, experience has taught me to expect as much. What must I do? Nothing too difficult, just rid the port of every single rat with just one action. What? Are you serious? Deadly. You see a manic glint in her eye, which you had previously missed. But why? Why one stroke? Why not a slow eradication? I want to write a new poem. But, uh, I'm touched that you want to write an epic poem about me, but why don't you write the poem about seagulls or daffodils or something? Well, seagulls rarely make good sexual characters. They're a bit too, um, flighty. Besides, the poem is about me, not you. Sorry, I, I don't follow. I myself carried out the very same feat once upon a time. So why do you need me to repeat your most heroic of feats? It's all about objectivity and integrity. I need to be utterly divorced from the process. Um, okay, I suppose. So can you tell me how you went about achieving this? No, therein lies the challenge. Oh, why does it always have to be like this? We go back to... the face. Hello. Oh, it's you again. She glances at you with barely disguised disdain. I wonder what her problem is. Have you spoken with Thalcrush yet? Yes. You notice an unkept looking cat nearby. Despite its bedraggled appearance, it exudes power, strength, and intelligence beyond that of a normal cat. That's an interesting looking cat. Ah, yes, Belle. What a cat. Thalcrush trained her for me shortly after, and she single-handedly charmed all the rats in the port and drowned them. I love that story. My favorite part is how she managed to get rid of all the rats. Would you tell it to me? I don't know. I really shouldn't. I'll get the story out of her. A little sweet talking should do the trick. Oh, please tell me. I'm sure you'd tell the story wonderfully. You have such a pretty... Yes? The face's face perks up at the mention of the word pretty. Voice. Oh. And just as quickly, turns sour again. Dang. 
Which complements your radiant aura. That should do the trick. Oh, you're too generous. Do you know something? I think I'll tell you. My dude, don't tell Felgress about this. She'd only get sure with me. She's a storyteller, not me. One day. And that is how she drowned the rats. You just about managed to stay awake through the long and turgid recital of the story. The snake charmer of Paul Niv Nietzsche, from what you gathered, seems to play a critical role in this story. Perhaps I should pay this snake charmer a visit. We fly to Paul Niv Nietzsche and talk with the snake charmer. Excuse me. The snake charmer ignores you. You'll have to find some way to make him pay attention. The Snake Charmer snaps out of his trance and directs his full attention to you. I want to talk to you about animal charming. That depends. You can literally see the glint of money light up across his eyes. No way. No way what? The glint begins to wane a little. I've already given you some money. Listen, I would like to ask you about someone. Go on. Who? Felcrash the Bard. Ha! A look of disgust crosses his face. I taught her all she knows about animal charming, and then she uses the knowledge to kill. What's wrong with killing vermin? They're dangerous carriers of disease. Music should never be used to kill. I remember when we used to sing about love, not war, nor killing. Oh, things were a lot better in those days. So there's nothing I could do to get you teach me how to charm rats? Not a thing. What if I offered you some money? A glint of gold temporarily flashes across the charmer's eyes. Now we're talking. How much are we talking about? I'll teach you for 1,926,057 coins. I don't have that much money. You're a resourceful looking adventurer. I'm sure you'll work out something. Forget about it. I don't care. You know, you've blown it. What? I'm offering something invaluable and you'll quibble over a couple of coins? You start slowly walking away from the snake charmer. I'll do it for half the price. You keep walking. I'll do it for quarter the price. You don't even break stride. I'll... You'll what? In eighth? No. What do you mean by no? I mean I'll give you no more than 100 coins. You seem to have caught the snake charmer on the hop with the walking away con. An oldie, but definitely a beauty. Um, alright, so. The snake charmer sells you some music. You've still got the flute I gave you before, I think. Read the music and copy what it says when you play the flute. You should attract rats to you like flies to a bucket of dung. We return to Port Serum and play the flute according to the music sheet. Rats start appearing out of nowhere, seemingly drawn to your music. All the rats come out and follow us, then drown themselves. Ha! Huh, I did it! Did you see me? Yes, I saw that! Now what can I do for you? Don't keep me overly long! I'm trying to complete my poem! Can you show me how to train my cat into a wily cat? I can only train overgrown cats into wily cats. Quest complete? Yes, that's how the quest ends. She tells us she can't do anything for us. That's it. This quest does not have a sequel. This quest is not required for anything else. That's it. For those of you who watched the whole thing, I warned you. For those of you who skipped, well done. You're better off not knowing. I'm gonna sprinkle in some context here. The reward for this quest used to be access to the rat pits. These little manholes that are filled with sand used to be areas where you could fight other players' cats. Each of the NPCs we helped used to grant access to the pits in their respective areas, however, they were removed in 2016 because nobody used them and they were poorly done. Now instead of, I don't know, reworking or removing this terrible quest, they just cut out all the dialogue referencing the rat pits. I'd argue that's even worse than making the quest in the first place. At least the original developer put forth effort. Okay, rant over. Quest number 94, Spirits of the Elid. We take a flying carpet to the town of Narda and speak with Awusa the mayor. We tell him we're an adventurer looking for quests. He says they need help as their town is cursed. Their water fountain has dried up and when they try to bring buckets of water from the river, they dry up as well. Currently, their only source of water is from a Paul Nivnian who is selling water at ridiculous prices. Another salesman is selling something called chalk ice. 
They think they got cursed because they didn't protect a Ceredominus priest that came into town a few weeks ago. They found him dead by the river last week. They've been cursed ever since. We speak with an elder named Gazlor in a house nearby. He tells us about the river spirits, the guardians of the source of the Elid. He says the spirits will know why the town is cursed. He says nobody has spoken to them in many generations. He does, however, have a ballad which he gives us. It reads, The Ballad of Jerish. Clad in all the robes for she, we traveled north expediently. Go beseech the guardians we were since. So to the river's source we went. Through the cave we had to travel. There is a mystery to unravel. We came upon a great stone door, but our priestess knew the score. She used the great ancestral key. We passed through very easily. Three great men, all hewn of rock. Three small chambers they did block. The first all made of rock quite black, our fighting men went to attack. They went with arrow, blade, and spell, but the men they could not fell. Many men did fall that day, while others turned and ran away. I had little hope at all, as I watched my kinsmen fall. My warhammer I boldly heft and struck a blow, which while was deft, should give scant harm to one so strong, or so I thought. Nay, I was wrong. The rockman fell down with a crash, which sent up clouds of dust and ash. Just myself left, and alas, two more rockmen left to pass. Still buoyed on by my first success, onwards bravely I did press. Next man was of rock hued gray, and this one I planned to slay. Crushing blows I rained on him, but things were looking very grim. Not a scratch could I make, anon my limbs began to ache. The rockman gave a mighty roar, so fierce I made fast for the door. How to beat that second man, to this day I have no plan. My hammer never left a dent, I never reached whence I was sent. Before leaving the town, we head into the temple and steal some ceremonial robes and telegraph a key. We speak with Shirati, the custodian, and ask her what the key is for. She says it's to the holy chambers of the spirits of the Elid. The robes are torn, and we repair them. We head all the way north to the source of the river. We put on the robes and unlock the stone doors. We go to enter a door and are stopped by a golem. We crush it with our flail and enter the room. We shoot a target, and then the water begins flowing again. We go to another door and are attacked again. This one we chop with our scimitar. We mine some rocks, and this one's water starts flowing as well. Finally, we're attacked at the third door, and we stab this one down. We break the blockage here, and the water flows. We head out and can now access the spirit's domain. We speak to them. Their conversation flows between one another as they complete their sentences. We ask him why the fountain is dried up. They confess that they are the ones behind the curse. They also confess to killing the Ceredominus priest for disrespecting the ways of Elidinus and attempting to turn away the peoples of Narda from the desert gods. We ask if there's anything we can do to rectify this. They say the crime was the Narda people threw away a statue of Elidinus from the temple. If they don't have an image of Elidinus to pray to, then the curse will not be lifted. We return to the mayor and tell him what's going on. He says they threw the statue down a crevice near the town. Before we leave, we take his shoes. We climb down into the crevice and find ourselves in a pit of snakes with a genie in the back. We tell him we're looking for the statue. He says he'll give it back in return for the soul of the mayor of Narda. We give him the soul of one of his shoes, and he happily trades it for the statuette. He says he just wanted it because he'd heard that powerful beings collect souls. We bring the statuette to Shirati. We place it on the plinth. Quest complete. 52 prayer. Smite unlocked and the fountain is flowing again. Quest number 95, Devious Minds. Just outside Paterdomus is a hooded monk. He calls over to us and asks us to help him. He says their warriors need a specifically designed weapon to fight new and dangerous threats. The weapon is a two-handed mithril sword ground down to a slender blade on Doric's whetstone, bent into the shape of a bow and tied with a bowstring. We head to Doric's and create this ridiculous weapon. It's so strange we can't even figure out how to hold it properly. We deliver it to the monk. He asks for one more favor to deliver a gift to the monks of Entrana for their ceremony, which he unfortunately will not be able to attend. It needs to be a surprise though, we have to sneak it in through some sort of other realm, namely the Abyss. He says we need to stuff this orb into a large runecrafting pouch so it doesn't get damaged and deliver it through there. We put the orb in the pouch and do as we're told. We place the pouch on the altar and wait for the party to start. All of a sudden an assassin in black robes comes in and steals the relics the monks were holding.
We tell the high priest what happens, and he tells us to go find the monk that we were talking to. We return to Paterdomus, only to find a monk that was killed by powerful magic. We go back to the high priest and tell him. He says the stolen relic is an ancient artifact said to have awesome power. He tells us to inform Sir Tiffian Falador. We go to him and find out he already knows, but we fill in the details for him. He says they'll handle the rest. Quest complete. The sequel will be in two years. Speaking of, Happy New Year! Welcome to RuneScape 2006! I can't tell you how excited I am for the updates this year. We've already unlocked a bunch, but that'll have to wait for the next half episode. And I promised nine quests, so without any further stalling... Quest number 96, The Hand in the Sand. In Yenio, we speak with Bert in his home near the sand pit. He's in distress about losing his job. He works the sand pit, and he found a hand buried in it. He explains that the guard captain just drinks all day. He asks for our help. We agree to give him a hand. He gives us a rotting hand. We go to the pub and give a beer to the captain, then report the hand that Bert found. We give it to him, and the captain accidentally drops it into his beer, then hands it back to us. He says it's probably a wizard, and we should go to the Wizards Guild. We speak with our old acquaintance, Zavistic Rarv. We ask if he's missing any wizards. He looks at the hand and identifies it as Clarence, his most able student. We ask if he has any input to the matter at hand. He mentions we should investigate why Bert was working so many extra hours recently. We go back to Bert. We tell him we dug up quite a lot and ask about his job. He says his boss Sandy from Brimhaven has him delivering sand from Karamja to this pit just outside. We ask if he's gotten new hours recently. He gives us a copy of his rota or schedule. Oh my gosh, he works 16 hour shifts for 50 gold a week? We head to Brimhaven and find Sandy's office. We take a copy of Bert's original schedule off the table and accidentally punch a thief that was standing on top of Sandy. We see the original schedule actually only had Bert working 9 hour shifts for the first 5 weeks, at the same rate he's working 16 hour shifts for. Poor Bert is getting exploited. This game will not let us speak to Sandy. Instead, we pickpocket him and find some sand. We head back to Bert. We tell him to give us a hand because we're having a hard time believing he doesn't remember changing his hours. He says the wizards must be at fault. A weird scroll appeared a week ago. He gives it to us. It's glowing a little bit. We show it to Savistic. He says he recognizes it as a mind-altering spell. He says Sandy may have a hand in this. We say we think he has both hands and feet in it. He says we should get some true serum from Betty and Port Serum first. He gives us a magical orb. He also teleports us right to her shop. We speak with Betty, and she just asks for an empty vial in return. She gives us a bottle and tells us to squeeze red berries and white berries into it to make pink dye, then pour it onto a bullseye lantern lens. We make the rose sit in lens, and she says to just stand in the doorway and shine light through it into the empty vial we gave her. We do as we're told, and she makes the true serum. She says for the last ingredient, we'll need something from the person we want to use it on. She adds the sand we stole from him earlier. Finally, she says we need to dilute it in tea or coffee. We head back to Brimhaven and go to put the true serum into his coffee, but we realize we need to distract him first. We tell him a small parrot with a pink banana is sitting outside his window. While he's distracted, we pour the serum into his coffee, and he drinks it. We activate the scrying orb that Savistic gave us, and we talk to Sandy. We ask why Bert's rota is different. He admits he changed it. We ask why Bert doesn't remember it being changed. He says he bribed a wizard to bewitch Bert so he'd believe everything Sandy told him so he can make him work longer without paying him more. Truly evil. We ask him what happened to the wizard. Sandy confesses to murdering him so he wouldn't have to pay him. He buried him in the sand. We return to Savistic, and he watches the scrying orb back. He asks me to bring him five earth runes and a bucket of sand. We give them to him, and he fills Bert's sand pit in a single second. He says the sand pit will now refill itself magically, putting Sandy out of business. He says he sent some other wizards to check the sand pits for the rest of Clarence, and asks us to check in Tronas. We talk to the monk near the sand pit, and he tells us he found a head in it. He gives it to us. We take it to Savistic. Quest complete. After the quest, we speak with Bert and tell him what happened. Somehow, we tell him the wizards are going to give him a large compensation, even though we were never told this. He says he doesn't want to retire, though, and instead will deliver buckets of sand to our bank for us every day. Quest number 97, An Ocker's Lament. In the desert, we find a man named Lazim near a quarry of sandstone and granite. He used to be an accomplished sculptor before he had an accident causing him not to be able to hold a chisel. While he's been traveling, however, he found that he wants to build a statue here. He says he will guide us in crafting the statue. He asks us to bring him 32 kilograms of sandstone. We do. He fuses them all together and tells us to chisel it down to make a base. We do, and we place it down. Next, he asks us to bring him 20 kilograms more of sandstone. We mine them and give them to him again. He fuses them together and tells us how to chisel the next part. Then he yells at us and tells us to chisel more detail into the body. Now he says all we need is a head made of granite. He tells us to choose the head to use, and we choose a camel. We mine a chunk of granite, chisel it into a camel head, and place it on the statue. The ground crumbles beneath it, and Lazim pushes us in. 
we find ourselves in some sort of temple. Lazim says this was all gone according to plan. We ask him what's going on. He says he's definitely not looking for treasure or priceless artifacts from the Lost Ages. We say, okay, and go to leave. But Lazim asks us to help, and in exchange, we'll get a share of anything we find. He says we'll need to find our way to the top of the temple. We fell down to the bottom. He says he's heard stories of the doors in this temple requiring large limbs to unlock. He says we could use the ones from the statue. We chisel off all the limbs, and he hands us back the head. We go north and find a door, and insert an arm into it. We get a headache and see a black and white vision of someone named Anakra building a temple for her lord. The one we're in now. We snap out of it and head through. We find a large Z in the next room and take it. We keep heading on and place a leg into the next door, and get another monochrome vision. This one, of a platoon of knights attacking Anakra, only for her to kill all but one of them with a single spell. The last one yells out, FOR EVERAKA, and she laughs before freezing him solid. The next room has a K, which we take and then go to the next door and stick an arm into it. A third vision, this one of a man with the head of a camel named Akthanakos, speaking with an Akra. Akthanakos asks her why Zamorak won in the temple. She says she wish she never supported Zamorak. Akthanakos asks if she's willing to join their side. When he walks away, she lets out a sinister laugh. We head on through and take the R and find a door with a Z imprint, which we insert the Z we grabbed earlier into. The door won't budge, however, so we keep heading around the edge and put the final statue piece in. We see another vision of an Akra reanimating some bones, but they won't stay up. We find ourselves back where Lazim is and find an M on a pedestal we missed before. We take it and start placing the letters into the inner parts of the temple. K. R. M. Once we place the final letter, the doors unlock. We climb the ladder and find ourselves in a rather large area with some sort of lectern with a camel head imprint and a magical barrier we can't pass. We try and put the camel head into the imprint, but it's not quite big enough. We use the imprint to make a mold, then go out and get more granite to create another camel head using the mold. We place it on the pedestal and get another vision. Inakra admits she would never desert Zamorak and freezes Akthanakos. When we come to, Wazim catches up to us. He tells us the visions are traps to keep people away designed to make the victim insane. He says there's one more floor above this we need access to. He says we need to solve all the puzzles to dispel the barrier. In this room, we melt the frozen fountain using a fire spell. The next room has burnt out braziers. We investigate each one to find out what they had been burning in them at one point and replace them. Next, we clean out the furnace in this room and reignite it. Finally, in this room we find, uh, this guy? His name is Pinton. He asks if we're here to torture him. He says he knows we're a shape-shifted Majorat? We tell him we have no idea what he's talking about. He holds strong and says he's a strong soldier of Avaraka. He says he's very, very hungry. We give him an entire chocolate cake. He takes it and remembers his children that he's forgotten about being here for centuries. He remembers the puzzles of this room and offers to help. However, we've already solved them all. We pass it to Barrier and head to the final floor. We head over a pile of bones and find a giant skeleton and an Akra. The skeleton greets us and asks us for help. He says he's trapped in this form by an Akra. She tricked him into being her slave and also helped Zamorak become a god. He says if we help him, he'll give us a valuable amulet and some of his knowledge. He says we just need to finish building this wall and try to seal her in the temple. We take some stone from nearby and add it to the wall. An Akra just stands there for some reason while we cask of Amontillado her. Akthanikos is freed from her spell and rewards us with a camulet. This incredible, wondrous item allows the user to talk to the greatest of all beings in the desert, camels. One of a kind, glorious, incredible. Also, he teleports us back here. And Akra destroys the wall. The two trade quips and shift into their true forms. They both say they're going to the north and teleport away using ancient magics. Quest complete. Quest number 98, Cabin Fever. In Port Phasmatis, we find Bill Teach mumbling to himself. He says he's in dire straits. We offer to help, but he says he needs a pirate's help. However, none will sail with him. He asks if we'd like to be a pirate. We tell him yes, but he doesn't think we could pirate our way out of a chest full of piracy. But he'll take us anyway, as he has no alternative. He says he's captain of the Adventurous, and he's here doing some trading before heading back to the island of Mostly Armless, a pirate stronghold off the southern coast of Mauritania. It's like Brimhaven, minus the agility arena. He finally tells us why nobody will work with him. He got into an argument with another captain who vowed to sink a ship and kill all of his crew. His crew promptly deserted him. He tells us to meet him on the Adventurous. We set sail and are immediately attacked just as Bill thought we'd be. 
While we're under fire, he says we need to board their ship and destroy their cannon. We take a fuse, a rope, and a tinderbox and swing to their ship, but fail and fall into the ocean. We swim and climb up their ship, then blow the gunpowder barrel next to the cannon while avoiding all their attacks before swinging back over. Next, we have to seal the leaks below deck. We seal them with planks and tar. Next, Bill is feeling brave and tells us to swing over and plunder their hold. He's getting really annoyed at the way we talk. We swing back over and fall in again, then board their ship and plunder everything they have, and swing back, which we appear to be very bad at. We store all the plunder. Bill says now all we need to do is attack their ship. He says we need to repair the cannon first. We repair the barrel and somehow the wheel as well by replacing the barrel. Now we have to do the rest in a specific order. We need to clean the cannon, then put a charge into the cannon, then push it in with the ramrod, then put a canister into it. Then finally, attach and light a fuse to kill one of the pirates. Now it's time to sink them. We need to do the same thing, but with a cannonball, and three times. Well, actually, there's an RNG chance to miss, so three successful times. Two shots. Three. Whoops. Four. And five. Sinking their ship. Bill takes us to Mostly Armless, and we see a cutscene of him talking to a bartender named Mama. He's whining to her about how terrible we were right in front of us. Bill Teach begrudgingly acknowledges us as a pirate, and says we'll need to talk like one. He gives us a translation manual. He thanks us for our help and rewards us. Quest complete. 62 crafting. Quest number 99, A Fairy Tale 1, Growing Pains. We speak to Martin the Gardener in Draenor. He tells us that the GAG, or Group of Advanced Gardeners, have found that the yield of all crops all over RuneScape has been diminishing. He recommends we speak with them to try to find out what's going on. We speak to Elstan at the allotment nearby. He thinks it's just because there hasn't been enough rain lately. We get another opinion from Elaine and Taverly. He thinks it's from insects eating too many of their crops. Dantera and Catherby thinks it's because adventurers are using up all the patches. Elena near the beach says it's because the seasons are out of whack. Finally, Faith and Lumbridge asks what the others have said. We tell her, and she says that all of them are correct. She says the fairies that govern over all of those things are to blame. We head to Xanaris and find the Fairy Queen. She doesn't say much, but I just wanted to show you that she's here. We head back to Martin and tell him what we've learned. He says we should talk to the fairies. Now we go right back to Xanaris and the Fairy Queen is gone, replaced with the Fairy Godfather and his thugs, Slim Louie and Fat Rocco. We ask him where the Fairy Queen went. He says she's sick. He says a Tanglefoot arrived. She went to kill it, but something happened, and now she's in a magically induced coma. She's being taken care of by Fairy Nuff north of the bank. The Godfather warns us not to cause trouble before we leave. We find Fairy Nuff and the Queen, and tell her we're here to help find a cure. She explains the Queen returned from her battle, barely able to fly, and extremely weak. She writes down a list of her symptoms for us. She says her life force is slowly unraveling. Fairy Nuff has magically slowed her passage of time in order to prolong her survival. She says we need to speak with a mage named Xandar Horfire in the Dark Wizard's Tower. We climb to the top of the tower near Falador and speak with him. We tell him the situation and says a Tanglefoot would have just killed her outright. Something else must have drained her magical life force, but he has no idea what. We surmise we need to kill the Tanglefoot and try to take her magic essence back. He recommends we find Malignus Mortifier, as he's once killed a Tanglefoot. We find him with a bunch of elemental wizards summoning skeletons near Port Saren. We ask for his help, and he says we'll need to do something for him first. He wants a skull from Drainer Manor. We dig up a grave and rob the skull before giving it to Malignus. He tells us the only way to harm a Tanglefoot is with a pair of enchanted secateurs. He says he'll tell us how to make some. We need a crushed gemstone a snapdragon, and a potato cactus. Then, bring all of that to the nature spirit for him to perform a ceremony of Phasma Phasmatis Natura. Crush Jim. Potato cactus. And here's the fun part. There's only two ways to get a snapdragon currently, I believe, and that's farming, which we don't have the level for, or the Brimhaven Agility Arena. I swear I got one of these when the arena first came out, but I don't remember what I did with it. Well, I will see you in 10 minutes if I don't mess up at all. Uh-oh. Whew. Easiest perfect 10 tickets of my life. Oh, right, I remember now, we bought Toad Flax. Snapdragon acquired. Our old friend Philemon Tarlock is in the grotto waiting for us as he sensed we needed his help. We tell him the situation and he performs the ritual and disappears once again. Time to fight the Tinklefoot. We head down past the cosmic altar and squeeze into its lair. We find it at the end of this cavern and easily take it down. 
It was holding the Queen's magic secateurs. We take them to Fairy Nuff, but she tells us to give them to the Fairy Godfather first, as he'd be mad if we brought them straight to her. We do as she says. He says he'll give them to Fairy Nuff, and the Queen will be healed. Quest complete. Thank you all so much for watching. If you somehow made it all the way to the end, maybe you could leave me a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Special thanks to my friend who voiced in this episode. You're all beautiful people. Thank you again for watching. It's time to party like it's RuneScape in 2006. See you in the half episode.